The question is about characters, actors, characters hearing the interrogation of other actor characters. And shouldn't they be done in isolation? Shouldn't we interrogate Lester all by himself and then interrogate Carolyn all by herself and then bring them together? We could do that. I could do that. I have done that. Um, now, if that's the way you want to do the interrogation, then do it that way. Do it to suit you how you as a director want to handle this process. So there's nothing wrong with that. I prefer doing it with both of them there, hearing the interrogation of the other character, hearing the secrets of the other character, Carolyn hearing Lester say things to me as the interrogator that he does not dare say to her. Because my feeling is that Carolyn hearing that, she's going to hear it in a few moments anyway, but hearing that is powerful. More powerful than her being off in another room doing who knows what while I'm working with Lester by himself. I personally like the interweaving and the engaging of the characters, even in their deepest, darkest secrets. I'm not worried about them knowing too much because that comes up a lot. Well, how they wouldn't know all that. Um, someone said, you know, at this point in the story, he doesn't know that she's having an affair with the real estate king. And I bring up the affair with the real estate king. So now he knows. But the truth is, think about this. Rob, who is playing Lester, he read the script. He knows this. This is nothing new to him. Nothing at all. Is it new to the character? Yes, it's new to the character, but it's not new to Rob. So all of that information that's in the script is in Rob's head. That to me is a bigger problem than one little piece of information about her having this affair. The bigger problem is, I'll put it in a very graphic way, Rob, the actor, knows by the end of the story he's dead. He knows that, and he even knows who killed him. He knows that, and he still has scenes to do with that person who killed him. He knows that. Isn't that a bigger issue? And my way of dealing with that issue is to shut down the actor's mind. I can't erase what's in the actor's mind. But if I can shut down the actor's mind and activate the character's mind, then I can bypass a lot of those problems. But getting back to the question, I personally like the engaging on an emotional level of the secrets, the dark secrets, the fears, the shames, the aspirations that two characters are sharing it with each other in a very powerful dynamic way because I'm not going for information. I'm going for that emotional connection or friction between the two characters. <music> Using the interrogation process with smaller characters, minor characters, supporting characters, even one-day players, um, do I? The question is, do I use it? Yes, I do. How I use it is differently, because like with Lester and Carolyn, I'm looking at building a relationship, a deep deep-seated relationship between two people that will go through the entire film, all the way from the beginning to the end. That's what I'm building. If I have a character who comes in much less than that, and maybe is only in two or three or four scenes or something like that, um, I'm looking at the scope of their appearance in the, in the story, their impact in the story, and how much depth I need to go into to have that work effectively, and who they're in re relationship to. But do I use the same process? Yes, I use the same process. And I, getting back to what I was talking about once before, I will use it in the casting process with them. Even if I've just met them once quickly, Mark, you have five minutes with this person to decide whether or not she's going to play this small character, I will even there interrogate her as that character to get a sense of who she is. Then the question becomes, 
when you have someone who comes in just for one day, and maybe, and this happens too much too frequently, you haven't really had time with that actor at all. Or maybe you haven't even met the actor due to circumstances you had to recast or something like that. I will even then use the interrogation process in a very uh, uniquely styled way with that actor for about three or four minutes when I first meet them on the set where I can turn them into the character very, very rapidly. It's been called high-speed directing, but how I can take that actress and turn her into that character so that she's ready to do the scene that she's going to do that day. I can do it very quickly. I can inject enough information into her about the character, who she is, her relationships to other people, turn her into a real person, not just, for instance, a waitress. She's now a person with needs and desires and fears and aspirations. She's got a lot going on that I can keep stimulating during the day with a couple of comments and a couple of questions to keep her authentic on the screen. Here's the question. Good question. Characters who are in a scene have no lines, have nothing to say, and maybe even have minimal impact on the scene, but they're there. Uh, they're maybe important characters because they're related to the people somehow. Uh, but how, how do we work with them and how do we give them a sense of life uh, during this scene? Now, I'm not talking about background actors. I'm talking about actors who are actually in the scene. Background is a whole different matter, but people who are actually in the scene are engaged in the scene, but have nothing to say. There's no written text for them. The solution is um, a little complicated, but it's pretty direct and simple. Realize that every actor, lines or no lines, is having thoughts, feelings, emotions, beat by beat by beat by beat during the scene. That's what they're having. Now, some of the characters actually say things in response to those emotions or their feelings or ideas or thoughts that they're having. They will express something. Others won't. Now, we're talking about the ones who don't, but the ones who don't still have those feelings. And it's our job to help the actors understand and um, maneuver that emotional roller coaster that they go on during the scene. So what I have done with a lot of actors uh, who are key actors, but who have nothing to say in the scene, is I go through them with it, with the beats of the scene. Not It has nothing to do with the dialogue. With the beats of the scene. If your father said this to you, what would you think? If your mother said this to you, what would you think? <clears throat> think when your mother brings out that dessert, that dessert, do you like that dessert? No, I don't. Well, what, why is she bringing it? Now, I'm mentioning events that are happening in the scene to the character now, the actor knows that I'm bringing up events that are going on in the scene. But the character will respond like, if my mother did this, if my mother did that, that's how I feel. Now, what we're actually doing is we're marking the emotional journey of the character through the scene. And I've done this many times, and I've seen actors walk away from the, that very brief interrogation. It's very, very, very brief. Um, and they go into the scene, and you watch them, and there's a lot of stuff coming on. When that dessert comes out, she has an attitude. When the father won't speak to her, she has an attitude, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She, I mean, it's already programmed inside the character. It's not programmed inside the actor for how to respond. It's programmed inside the character because I was asking the character, what would you think, how would you feel if this happened? Mm -hmm. 